Let's just say I took one for the team yesterday. If you're gonna watch the Lifetime's Doomsday Mom and it's loosely based on events movie, then be careful eating your popcorn because you're either gonna choke on it or you're gonna chuck the bucket at the TV. These are a couple hours I will never get back. So before I get into the summary of the entire movie, I'm gonna say this. Uh, Lori isn't ditzy enough in the movie. And Chad Daybell comes off as some spiritual Casanova, which isn't one iota of who or what Chad really is or comes across. There is actually zero awkwardness from Chad Daybell in the movie. And there's also no mention about Lori's niece, Melanie, getting married, nor Alex getting married to Zulema. Now, there are so many discrepancies in the movie that I literally forced myself to watch it. And I actually had to pause and then vent about the issues. Mr. Linda's laughing. And uh, if you're not too familiar with the case, then just know that a large amount of what was put into that video, well, should have been fact checked at the very least. I don't know what their motive was or what they were trying to do, but a lot of things didn't happen. So anyways, once I started watching, I literally stopped at the two minute mark and I said, I can't even watch anymore. In fact, I don't even know if I made it into 20 seconds yet. <laughs> I actually said, how am I gonna get through this? Mr. Linda was in the background. He says, what soap opera are you playing? It sounds like a soap opera. Are you watching a soap opera? So in the beginning, it opens up with the family scene. Everybody's happy. You see Charles kiss Lori and everything's all happy. They all gather around the dinner table. Then the scene goes to Lori meeting Melanie Gibb for the first time. Melanie Gibb says, oh, I know Chad Daybell. I've met him. And Lori says, oh, his books were scary. Now, Lori actually became obsessed in real life with Chad Daybell's books back in 2015. And it's interesting here that she's saying they're scary. Now, more on that in a moment. In the next scene, they show Lori praying and she's talking about not having a murderous heart. And then it shows a scene next of Tylee crying about Joseph dying. And it's interesting because the murderous heart part was put into the movie before Joseph died. Now, in real life, Obviously, we don't know if Lori was praying about a murderous heart before Joseph died, but in real life, six months after Joseph died, Lori was at a gathering and she was talking about Joseph dying and that if he comes against her once, twice, three times, then she can kill him. And so this is very interesting to me in the order or the sequence that they did that. So then in the movie, Lori meets Chad and that was at an event in St. George, Utah, and which is true. And Chad says to her, it's no accident that you're here today. We've been married nine times before. As I said, Mr. Linda's in the background. He's like, this crap works. If only I knew that when I was 18 years old. <laughs> so Chad says, uh, we've been married nine times before and we've battled shoulder to shoulder. And Lori says to him, did we win or lose? And Chad says, a little of both, but this time we got to win because this time is the final one. Now, then they take a walk and Chad starts talking to Lori about light and dark in the movie and the 144,000. Lori says she understands the 144,000 are the people who are saved when the end of times come. And Chad says they don't get saved by themselves. They have to be brought together by an elite core of chosen leaders. You're one of them, he says. That's why we have been brought back into each other's lives again, right at the tip of the edge of the apocalypse to pull that off together. So then Chad brings up the aliens and the spirits and zombies while they're on this walk and says they are out to destroy the elite leaders. And Lori asked, how do we stop them? Chad says, our only power is to pray for the death of the hijacked bodies before they kill us and trust and believe they have the power to do that. So they end their walk in front of an elevator and Lori says to Chad, what did you see when you looked at me? And Chad says, something that just about knocked me over. I saw that you are nothing less than a God beyond anything you can imagine. And in the end, you're not just going to win. You're going to bring back the savior and redeem the world. In the movie, they suggest that the day that Lori and Chad met is when they kind of fell in love and they started kissing in the elevator. 
Um, when they're in the elevator, Chad told Lori about being a god. And as the door was closing, they were going in for a kiss. So this would be in October that they met and it's right before Lori held an event at her house with Chad there and some other friends. Lori was still married to Charles and Charles was away on business. In the next scene, Lori was talking to Chad while they were laying together and talking and Lori was talking about Alex. She says, it's my brother Alex. He's the person I'm closest to in the world. I'm just scared he's not going to be the one that's saved. I don't want to live for eternity without him. And Lori says that the devil has been following her since she's a little girl. So Charles then goes away on business and Chad's invited to her house. And Chad says he wanted Lori to meet some friends and the elite. Now while Chad was over at the house, Charles was away, and she asked Chad, are you gonna divorce your wife? Now this literally is like two weeks later. Chad says, God showed me very clearly we are not supposed to divorce our spouses. He says that he saw a vision that both of them were going to die. And Lori says, well, I want to be with you now so that we can start our mission together. Now remember, Chad sent Lori seven missions to accomplish together via email, along with that light and dark rubric that was not shown in the movie. Now in the movie when Chad was over at Lori's house, they embrace and Lori goes to her room and Chad knocks on the door the next morning and says, I had a vision last night, one of the most powerful I have ever had. Charles needs help. Charles isn't Charles anymore. He's been taken over by an alien spirit. The man who you used to call your husband has gone dark. Lori says there's no way that he's a dark soul. And Chad says, do you think darkness doesn't know how to put on a fake mustache and a smile? <laughs> Chad says, I saw a vision. There's danger for you and for the children, but don't be afraid because you are a god, more powerful than a million dark souls. Then in the movie, Chad shows Lori a portal, which is the closet, and he says to her, I've opened a portal in here so we could always communicate. You just have to call out to me and I'll hear you. So she later goes into the closet and she starts talking to Chad. She says, Charles is gone. He's filing for a divorce. Then she starts talking to Chad in her portal closet and says, I see you everywhere at the mall on the street. I keep seeing people and think it's you. And when they turn around, it's not you. I crumble. And then Lori calls Chad on the phone because she hasn't heard back. She says, why didn't you answer through the portal? Chad says the dark spirits must have interfered. Lori says, you said you'd come down soon. And Chad says it's getting tougher with Tammy. So then it shoots to when the email comes in to Chad about uh, Charles wanting him to go do a book. This was actually an email written by Lori. And Lori phones Chad because Charles finds out and gets mad about this email. So Lori phones Chad to give him the heads up. She tells him that Charles is mad because he found the email and Chad tells Lori to stay close to Alex. So July 11, 2019 is the day that Charles died and was killed. Now in the movie, all they show is Charles just walking through the door on his own at Lori's house and Lori isn't there in the scene. Which is funny because in the affidavit, Charles arrives, Lori answers the door, but Charles walks in, opens it, calls out to Tylee and JJ saying the bus has arrived and all you see is Alex show up right away in the scene and they look at each other. That's all that was shown. And then the next scene is when Alex was sitting on the curb. Now, in real life, Alex was dabbing at his head and in this movie, Alex was not. Now, this is very, very interesting because in real life, what happened was Charles came to the house to pick up JJ to take him to breakfast and then take him to, uh, to school. And Charles was staying in town at a hotel. He was gonna bring him back there, give him breakfast, and then go to school. So this wasn't shown at all. No sign of Lori, no bat, no anything. So the scene then shows Alex coming out to the curb and sitting down talking to the cops. Now, I'm just thinking that if you wanna make a really good movie, you might want to put some factual information in it. I don't know. If you're going to tell the story about, oh, I don't know, the biggest case of, in history or in this century, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. 
then there's a mistake in the movie, a straight up legit mistake. Because the guy playing Alex, and I rewound this a few times because I was like, what did he just say? He says, she hit me in the back of the head. When in real life it's claimed that Charles hit Alex in the back of the head with the bat. So the actor said, she hit me in the head. Now, you know the most, I guess, infamous scene of Lori laughing while the cop is taking down her particulars about her height and weight. And um, I mean, that's really, really well known. So this is interesting because it does show Lori and Tylee driving up, but it was ridiculous, in my opinion. Let me know what you think if you saw the movie. The cop in the movie says, you know your husband is deceased. And Lori said, wow, live on this totally quiet street. And it's like, hey neighbors. So this is not what happened. Lori shows up. She already knows darn well that Charles is dead. And the cop never, not once, asks that information. And I realize it's a movie, but still. Lori shows up and just right away is saying, live on this totally quiet street. And it's like, hey neighbors, that's not what happened. She actually said, well, yeah, we just lived here for a couple weeks. And it's like, ah, sorry neighbor. So anyways, it was hard not to shut this junk off. <laughs> but I'm dedicated, so I kept going. So Lori then calls Chad, Chad answers, she says, Charles is gone, and Chad says, gone where? She says, gone forever, struck down by the hand of God. He says, what hand was that? And Lori said, he tried to kill Alex, so Alex had to shoot him. Then they showed the pool party, which did happen, just hours after Charles died. Lori goes up to Tylee in the movie and says, don't look so sad, Tylee. Charles would have wanted us to be happy, to celebrate his life. Tylee says, five hours after he died? And Lori says, yeah. And then she tells JJ that Charles is working in California. Then in the movie, it shows Lori's calling in about the life insurance policy. She asks if there was any paperwork that's needed before being paid out. She finds out that she's not getting paid. And she calls Chad, tells him what happened, says, I have kids to support, bills to pay. JJ is in the perfect school. I don't want to turn his world upside down. No? Only gets rid of the service dog, you know, takes JJ out of the perfect school and puts him in a regular school, which he has, or I should say had special needs, and he was on the autism spectrum and he had ADHD so this school was perfect for him and he was thriving but you know she doesn't want to turn his whole world upside down not to mention Charles being killed lying to him about it and the list goes on I digress Chad then mentions there are townhouses a mile away from where he lives she could move to Idaho Lori snarks back and says I'm sure that Tammy would love that and Chad reassures her and says, remember my vision. And Lori says, and this is the line you can't even make it up, in the entire movie, I actually burst out laughing, um, legit. She says, I love you, but I don't want crumbs of you. I want the whole cake. Here's the whole cake, ladies. Sandals and all. Then Chad calls and they talk about how long it would take for her to wrap things up in Arizona and hit the road. Lori says, a month, maybe three weeks. Chad says, God sent me a vision. Less than two weeks, Tammy would die in a car crash. By the time you get here, I will be free. So in the next scene shows Tylee and they're talking about moving. And Tylee says, well, I want to graduate with my friends and I don't want to move to Idaho, which is true. Tylee didn't want to move to Idaho, but then she wanted to be with JJ and protect him and she said yes. But here's the thing, Tylee already graduated when all this was going down. She graduated early and this is in July or just after and it's after school's finish. And way back in the new year where things were going on with Charles and Charles was accused of taking her purse and la di da di da um, they were in the police station and Melanie Gibb was there and Tylee and Lori. And the officer was talking to Tylee and says, 
Uh, what school do you go to? And Lori says, well, she graduated. And Tylee says, yeah, I just graduated. And the officer says, oh, you just gra graduated, got your GED. So back to moving to Rexburg, Lori says, when the earthquake hits, the safest place to be is Rexburg, Idaho. You know, that's what God told Chad. And Tylee says, says Chad. So change a scene, and then they show Melanie Boudreau, who at that time was Melanie Boudreau before she became Melanie Pulowski, and she's seen talking to Brandon Boudreau. And she says, Chad told me you've gone dark. He saw it in a vision. You can have the house, whatever you want, as long as you don't get in the way of the mission. Sound familiar? So then it showed in the movie that Lori had moved, there's boxes, and she assumed that Tammy was already dead. She's in that new house, like I said, with boxes everywhere, and Chad says she hadn't died yet. Lori has a fit and says, maybe you just found a way to cheat on your wife and have your girlfriend hanging on a string. She says, we need to talk. So they meet up and Lori tells them, I hate that I can't hate you and I should. Maybe we should stop seeing each other and I stop being a god and just be a mom. Chad tells her, there's something I didn't want to tell you, thinking it was a lie from the adversary. I'm commanded to tell you. For once, I just want to disobey it. Lori says, what? And Chad says, Tylee and JJ need help. You're the best mom that I've ever known. And you love Tylee and JJ with all your heart, but they are not Tylee and JJ anymore. They've been taken over by alien spirits. They've gone dark. Then we get to Larry and Kay, and I'm betting if Kay and Larry saw this junk, they would be super ticked off, if not more. It shows a scene of Larry and Kay talking to JJ and asking how Idaho was. And it was a totally leisurely call, which is not what happened. Seriously, this was probably the worst part in the whole entire movie because Lori cut off communication with JJ and his grandparents back in August before they moved to Idaho. And it was an under 30 second phone call. It was, it, it was a nothing phone call. And JJ just said hi and then gotta go. And it was as if JJ was reading something on a board is what Kay and Larry said. So this is so, this actually is the worst part in the entire movie. I feel like it was like, are you kidding me? Lori didn't tell anybody that she was moving other than Alex and Melanie and the other Melanie, but her family, like Colby didn't know, Larry and Kay didn't know. It's just absolutely ridiculous. I, I, I was so fed up at this, at this point, I had more to go. So they show a scene with Tylee and Tylee wanted to go out to see her friend and Lori said no. And then Tylee says, too bad, I'm going out anyways. And Lori is seen saying, oh my God, it's true. You're not you anymore. The real Tylee is killed. And Tylee says, you're the one who's not you anymore. Lori says, oh my God, he's right. Tylee is gone. She says, not me, mom. And that was in real life was said to have been um, said ages before that, not in Idaho. So the next scene is Yellowstone Park. They show them taking a picture, which is Alex, Lori, JJ, and Tylee. And then Tylee just disappears in the movie. And then JJ is seen back at home asking where Tylee is. Lori lies to uh, JJ, which is what she's known to do best, and saying that Tylee's away at BYU. And then in the next scene, it shows the text from Chad to Tammy about the raccoon he sees in the yard and burning limb debris. And uh, you know, that's where Tylee was buried in the pet cemetery. And the response in the movie from Tammy said, glad you took care of it. But what Tammy actually said is good for you. Cause Chad says, well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery fun times. And then Chad does one more text and says, gonna shower now and then go right for a while at BYU. Love you. And Tammy says, good for you. She does not say glad you took care of it. Then it flashes to the weekend where Melanie Gibb visits Lori, the weekend that JJ died. And in the movie, Melanie goes to Tylee's room. Lori's showing where she's going to be staying. And Melanie says, doesn't she still have her senior year? And Lori says she got her GED. Now remember, Melanie Gibb was 
in that police station when Tylee said she got her GED in real life. Then in the next scene, Melanie Gibb, Lori, and Alex are shown about JJ going dark. This is the same weekend. It shows that Lori is questioning maybe Chad was wrong. And Alex says, God has a pretty good record of making himself clear to Chad. Then they are shown doing the podcast, but it was Melanie Gibb, Alex, and Lori. No sign of David Warwick this whole weekend. JJ comes running through in the movie looking for his iPad and is looking everywhere and then goes uh, on the top uh, while you see basically him knocking a figurine of Jesus. And in real life, uh, what was said was it's a picture of Jesus being knocked off the fridge after JJ climbs onto the cabinets. And the podcast was shown in the movie being filmed during the day when it was actually recorded at night and with Melanie, David, and Lori, not Alex. Alex was to be with JJ. And so, it discrepancies everywhere. It's, it, I, I can't, I can't. Um, now, when, in real life, when Melanie Gibb and David were leaving the next morning, they had asked where JJ was, and Lori said, oh, <clears throat> he got upset and knocked down the picture of Jesus, and Alex took him away. Then in the movie, it showed September 23rd, 2019, and Lori advised the school that JJ would be homeschooled, and according to the court documents, in real life, it was actually 24th. Here's what the affidavit of probable cause says. Through the investigation, Rexburg Police Department has learned that the last day JV was seen alive was on September 23, 2019 at Kennedy Elementary School. On September 24, 2019, Lori Vallow informed the school that JJ would no longer be attending Kennedy Elementary and that Lori would homeschool him. Now on to the rings. Lori suggests in the movie that she's the one that wants a Malachite ring. Chad asks why. She says because it has the power to break down our war patterns, something like that, and open the heart to unconditional love. It's then shown that Kay is reporting JJ missing and that uh, she hadn't heard from Lori in five weeks and said she's had enough. Then it shows a bit of the storage unit taking out the tire. That was from the Jeep, remember, when Brandon Boudreaux had a shot taken at him and made, had that attempt made on his life. It was said by Alex. So the attempt was made and Brandon is shown in the scene being questioned by authorities. And he says a half a million of life insurance money. In real life, Brandon says, I can think of one million reasons why they wanted him dead. And he had a $1 million policy with Melanie Boudreaux as the beneficiary. So ridiculous. It's These are easy checks. I like it. I don't know. Um, so Melanie Boudreaux gets a phone call to the authorities in the movie and asks, where was she that day? And she says she was with her aunt right here in Rexburg, which is a load of BS. Melanie was actually in Arizona the day Brandon had his attempt made on her, his life because Brandon had to go drop the kids off with her in a custody exchange. Here's from the court documents. On October 2nd, 2019, father left his home at approximately 7.20 a.m. to drop the older children off at school and exchange the younger children with mother. After the exchange, instead of immediately returning home to work, father went to the gym and did not arrive back at his home until approximately 9.13 a.m. And then he had the attempt made on his life. You see what I mean here? Super frustrating. Now, it changes the scene to Chad Daybell and Tammy dying. And in it, Chad says, I woke up and she was lying like this, meaning Tammy, and it shows Tammy on the ground. Now, Chad's known for this discrepancy because it said that he woke up and she was lying peacefully beside him. And then there has been other chatter where she was on the ground when she was found. And so there's that. Now, in the next scene, it's really confusing because you see a box delivered to the door or to Lori's house. And then you see Alex open the box and it's a ring and he gets on one knee and shows it to Lori. I, I don't know. I I'm not even joking you, super weird. Then it shows Lori giving Melanie Gibb the heads up that she's gonna be getting married in Hawaii to Chad. And 
Melanie mentions, well, it's only been a couple of weeks since Tammy died. Now, in real life, Melanie says that she didn't lo know that Lori got married until Lori sent an email with pictures of their wedding in Hawaii. You know, the ukulele ones. Then the welfare check happens and Kay calls to report all this, as I said. The authorities then talk to Chad and Alex back at Lori's complex and Alex's complex and Melanie Boudreaux. And in the movie, they, it suggested that the cops said, uh, you know, hey Chad, how do you not know your wife? Which they didn't state that anywhere in the court documents. And also it was on body cam, that was never said. Now it did show Lori asking Melanie Gibb to take that uh, picture and say that she took JJ to Frozen to the movie. That was correct. Lori said in it, you'll do that for us, right Melanie? So then the Melanie Gibb call came in to Chad and Lori, and that's when she recorded Lori and Chad, and it was actually the most accurate wording in the whole movie. That phone call was pretty accurate, what they showed. One of the very few things that was accurate. Then they talked about the exhumation of Tammy on December 11th. Nothing more on that though, and then Alex wasn't feeling good and died. Nothing more on that either. Lori's then asked to produce the children. They arrest Lori and the authorities talked about cracking Alex's phone and his pings very briefly and then the kids were found. Now Chad was then shown talking to Lori on the phone while Lori was sitting in jail. That's the day that the kids were found on June 9th. Now in the movie Chad was shown sitting in a house talking to Lori but in reality Chad was actually sitting in his vehicle talking to Lori and he was watching as they were digging up the children in the yard. And in the video, it was suggested that Alex did all the work um, of burying JJ. Now, Chad was shown arrested in the movie coming out of the house, which again, that's not true. Chad was in his vehicle as the children were being dug up. And then when JJ was being d uh, dug up, he actually was gonna make a run for it. And he started to flee, but the cops stopped him, got him out and arrested him. So we know Chad is prone to fleeing, even though John Pryor doesn't think so. No mention, as I said, of the other weddings happening around the same time, uh, back in the end of November, basically. And the story ends with a shot of Lori in jail. And she's talking about Kobe Bryant dying, and yet she's the biggest story out there. And then what comes next is actually the biggest part of the whole movie. But because they did such a horrible job at the truth, I don't even know if this is true or not. However, it is a, a bombshell. Lori says, at my last probation, just like my last life, I had an affair with an angel, and the child we had together is my lawyer. That's why I chose him. He's my beautiful blue-eyed boy, so I know I can trust him with my life. I can say with 110% accuracy that I'm terribly disappointed in this movie. Not that I had high hopes, but as I said, you'd think with a trial of a century, if they were going to do a movie and do at minimum a good job on it, you'd think they'd lock down the very basics. Or is that too much to ask? because, and maybe it's because I've done over, I think 140 videos on the Vallow Daybell case. I don't know, but I had a lot of breaks while watching this and I was swearing at the screen a few times. So Lori was definitely made to look more like a victim in it. However, I don't believe that for one second. She's just as manipulative as Chad Daybell. And I, I think that Lori and Chad brought out the worst in each other. It was the perfect storm, so to speak. And I believe that they both had an equal hand in it, yet it was portrayed that Alex was the one to blame. And uh, there's way more than that, for sure. Not to mention both Melanie's roles in it. It's an absolute mess. My review on this one is skip it, unless you feel like throwing your popcorn and wasting it. So let me know your thoughts below. And let me know if you've seen it or if you're going to see it now that it's just a, a big mess. You can see the discrepancies. Let's have a chit chat below. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like and please share. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.